So today we're going to be talking about nomenclature. We're going to name ionic compounds. And let's begin by looking at the periodic table. This is something that we've already talked about, but I want to make sure you remember where the metals are versus where the nonmetals are. Right? If you look at our periodic table over on the wall, or the periodic table that I gave you, right? Everything to the left of the zigzag line, those are the metals, right? Everything to the right, those ones are non-metals, and then the ones touching. Now, aluminum is not considered a metalloid, okay? But aluminum is a purely a metal, so don't exclude it. But all the other ones touching that line are those ones we consider metalloids, which means they have properties of both. But for all intents and purposes, they are still considered either a metal or a non-metal in terms of nomenclature and how we um, write their formulas. So properties of metals versus properties of non-metals, I think this is something you're pretty familiar with. If you want to think of just like the stereotypical classic metal, think of like aluminum foil, right? Because it has all the properties of a metal. It's shiny, it's a solid at room temperature, it's malleable, it can be hammered out into a sheet, it's ductile, it can be drawn into a wire, it's a good conductor of heat, it's a good conductor of electricity. Right? That's all properties of metals. And then if you want to think of the opposite of that, that would be the non-metals, right? So most of them, not all, um, most of them are not solid at room temperature. A lot of them are liquids and gases. There are ones that are solid, right? Carbon, like graphite, that's what's in your pencil. Your pencil doesn't have lead, it actually has graphite in it. Um, it's brittle, it's not, uh, you know, something that's really, really hard. Think like aluminum foil, but you can rip it, but it's a little bit of a, that's because it's in a thin sheet. It's a poor conductor of heat and electricity. Um, so again, if you know the properties of one, you know the properties of other. Other nonmetals are gases at room temperature. So for instance, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, those are all nonmetals, and they're all gases at room temperature. Okay, so just think about if you understand one, by opposite, you know the other. Let's also talk about organizing the periodic table just to make sure we're all in the same uh, boat here. Vertical column, we call that a group or a family. It makes no difference whether you call it a group or a family. So when I say everybody find group three, <coughs> what we're using is this A notation, okay? So you notice this figure has A and then B. So if you're using the B notation, you'd go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, this way. Whereas if you're using the A notation, you'd go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Like we're gonna use the A notation. And so if I say everybody look at group seven, this is what I'm talking about, okay? Now, vertical, that's for vertical columns. For horizontal rows, we call those periods, right? So if I say, okay, look at all the period three elements, right, that's what I'm talking about this way. Okay, periods go this way, groups go this way. We're gonna be talking specifically about groups today because we're gonna be talking about ions. Everybody good? on groups versus periods. I don't usually refer to you a specific period of the periodic table. A lot of times I'll say, okay, let's talk about group two elements versus let's talk about period three. I usually refer to group versus period. All right, so let's talk about valence electrons. This is a term you may have seen before if you took chemistry in high school. Valence electrons are the ones that are easily gain, lost, or shared, okay? Valence electrons, furthest away. Now we haven't talked about the quantum model. We're gonna get greater detail into that later in the semester. Right now we're gonna get into bonding, and then when we go back to the quantum model, then we can tie it back to what we've talked about here. Uh, valence electrons are the ones that we can gain, lose, or share easily, valence electrons. All right, now, look at your periodic table. The number of valence electrons comes directly from the periodic table. It's really easy. Everybody in group one has one valence electron. Everybody in group two has two valence electrons. This group right here, this big chunk, it's called the transition metals. We're gonna skip them right now. <coughs> You'll take an entire class on this here at Chem Major. Two plus, we're gonna skip them right now. 
This is group three, they all have three valence electrons. This is group four, they all have four valence electrons. Five, six, seven, and eight. All right, so if you just number this on the periodic table, and I say, all right, how many valence electrons does um, sulfur have? Right, sulfur's here in group six, so the answer would be six. Okay, so just number your periodic table. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Straight from the periodic table. Very easy to determine. All right, so use your periodic table and figure out how many valence electrons each element has. Rubidium, sulfur, carbon, and krypton. This should take about 10 seconds. Just look at your periodic table. Rubidium is RB, by the way, if you didn't know that one. I don't think that was one of the ones we required, was it? Yeah. It was? Okay, I couldn't remember. Because intro chem and gen chem do different lists. How many valence electrons does rubidium have? One, right. How many does sulfur have? Six. Carbon would be four. And krypton would be eight. Good. Does everyone see how we're doing this? It's just straight from periodic table. I'm not going to ask you how many valence electrons does manganese have in this class. Okay, because the answer is transition metals do their own thing. We're going to worry about them in their own course. So we're not going to worry about that right now. So the goal of every atom, if you want to think about what an atom thinks about in the morning and the night, every atom's goal is to have either zero valence electrons or eight valence electrons. It's the most stable electronic configuration. And again, we'll get back to this and we get to the quantum model. But for now, just take my word for it, okay? If you were an atom, when you woke up in the morning, you'd say, my goal today is to have zero or eight. No, we're going to gain, lose, or share to get to that. Now, if we're talking about a metal, a metal, everything to the left of the zigzag line, those form cations. So in other words, they lose electrons to get down to zero. And nonmetals form anions, so they gain electrons, to get up to eight. So we're going to be talking about ionic bonding because cations and anions are both ionic substances. So what does that mean? An ion is a <coughs> excuse me, ion is an atom that has a net charge. When we talked about atomic theory on Monday, we were talking about neutral atoms, right? They have no charge. These now are ions, which means they have a positive charge or a negative charge. So if you're a metal, you form a cation, and if you're a non-metal, you'll form an anion. And I'll demonstrate that for you in just a second. So let's go back to the periodic table. Oh, yes, and everyone else is going to share. We'll talk about covalent bonding as well. So let's look at the gaining and losing electron situation first. So we need to break down a few words. Monatomic. What does mon prefix mean? We've already seen that when we talked about monatomic elements. So what would a monatomic ion be? Is that going to be a, a group of atoms or a single atom? Single, right? Monatomic. Mon means one. One atom. So a monatomic ion is an ion that's composed just of one single atom. Okay? An ion is an atom that could be monatomic or polyatomic. That's what a group of atoms is called. That charge. So if it's a cation, it has a positive charge, and if it's an anion, it has a negative charge. So a couple of ways you can remember this. Cation has the word T in it, right? Which looks like a plus ion. So that's a convenient way to remember it. If you are thinking about a battery, the cathode and the anode, right? Do we know those terms from battery composition? If you don't, we'll talk about them in Chem 2. Great detail. Um, we talk about electrochemistry. But the cathode, path cathode. The cathode is the positive, and the anode is the negative. Okay, so you can think back to other terms if, um, if you're familiar with those. But the easiest way to remember it, right? Plus ion. T. Anions don't have a plus ion. They have to be the opposite of plus, so that's negative. So a monatomic ion is just a single atom with a charge, whereas a polyatomic ion is a group of atoms with a net charge. That's what you're going to be clean on one week from today. Those polyatomic ions that you're required to memorize. They're on page 69 in your book, plus the four that I've added. Okay? So monatomic ions, we'll start with them today. We're going to get into polyatomic ions today, too. But let's start here with single atoms, and then we'll look at groups of atoms. Does everyone understand what a monatomic ion is? Single atom that has gained or lost electrons. It's the simplest ion you can have. Again, if you don't want to write all these terms down during class, I would suggest that you go to um, D2L, go to the Notes Summaries tab uh, under the Content folder, and then you can download this, and you don't have to sit here and write all this vocab, because right? you have it right there in front of you, and you can just add to it. All right, so let's look at the periodic table. The goal, here's our goal, to get eight or to get zero. So here's how many valence electrons, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes. So here we are, group one, one valence electron. Which is easier, to gain seven, to get out to eight, or to lose one and get out to zero? Lose one, right? Now, electrons are negative, correct? If you lose something that is negative, your charge is now 
positive, right? Just like if I said, hi guys, I'm having any test, trying to take any quizzes, we're doing homework, we're just doing everybody A just for easy, right? You probably be happy because those tests and quizzes and things, most students perceive it as negative. So if I've taken away something that is negative, your charge now is positive, right? So if you take away something that is negative, you go on the electron, that electron's negative. So if you lost a negative, then you put one ion, an atomic ion, you'll have a charge of plus one. Does that make sense? Let's look at group two. In group one, yes, they'll all be plus one. So if we're looking at group two, right, which is easier, gain six or lose two? Still easier to lose two than gain six, right? Electrons are negative, so if I've lost those two out the window, that means that all these guys are going to have a charge of plus two as monatomic ions. We're skipping the transition metals. Here's group three. We're looking at group three, which is easier, gain five or lose three? Still easier to lose three than it is to gain five. All electrons are negative, so if we lose them all, right, these guys will all have a charge of plus three. Now look at group four here. This is on the next We're not going to look at right now. We're just going to skip group four. Now we get to five. Okay, this is easier when we get to group five. Gain three or lose five. Now the scale shift in the opposite direction, right? Now we're gaining to get up to eight. So if I gain three electrons, my net charge is now negative, right? Because electrons are negative. So if I said to you guys, all right, I'm going to give you five new homework sets and all do tomorrow. I'm adding something that most likely to be perceived as negative. I right? would not be very happy if you give me some dirty looks. <coughs> I do. All right, if you gain three things that are negative, your net charge is now negative. So these guys are all negative three, and then I think you can figure it out, negative two and negative one. Eight, again, there's nothing listed for it. It's already got eight valence electrons, and the goal is going to have zero, right? <coughs> so we're going to... Does this make sense? All right, so again, you can... When you look at the transition metals, you see multiple charges here. That's why we're going to figure out what the charge is by working backwards, but I'm not going to teach you specific trends to predict it. Basically, you have to work backwards for the transition metals right now. So let's look at the difference between a cation and a neutral atom. And this is really important to understand. If we have a nucleus, has anything changed in the nucleus when we make an ion? No. Okay, that's a really common mistake I see on exams. We're not changing the number of protons or the number of neutrons when we make an ion. What are we changing? We're changing the number of electrons, right? This is Mg, this is Mg2+. Plus. All we've changed is we've lost two electrons, okay? What is the scenario that happens when we change neutrons? That's an isotope, okay? Make sure you understand the difference between an ion and an isotope. An isotope doesn't change the charge, it just changes the number of neutrons. An ion changes the number of electrons. It leaves the nucleus alone, okay? That's a big, big difference between nuclear change and just electrons. Same thing's true with an anion, okay? So if we're looking at nitrogen versus nitride, nucleus looks exactly the same. Protons and neutrons have not changed. What has changed? I've gained three electrons. Okay, so we haven't talked about what the electron field looks like yet, um, so we don't have to worry about sketching it at the moment. But what you need to understand is that we're not modifying the nucleus, we're modifying the number of valence electrons, okay? Make sense? Okay, because nitrogen is in group seven. I mean, excuse me. Nitrogen's in group five. So everybody in group five has a minus three charge. Now, if you want to add three, and three minus, I don't really get rid of shape like that. Okay. When you're writing ion, the ion has to have a charge. So n minus two and three minus two. That's a good question. Okay? When you're writing an ion, you have to include the charge. Because if you don't include the charge, if you just left that, then you, your reader would think you're doing magnesium, the metal, versus magnesium, the ion. So it's always Yes. Yes. All right, so take a second and figure out what the charges of each of these elements will be in their monatomic ion form. Use your periodic table. All right, what's the charge on chlorine going to be as a monatomic ion? Minus one, right. What is potassium going to be? Plus one, good. Magnesium, plus two, and aluminum, plus three, good. Any questions on how we identify this? Okay, so how do we name a monatomic ion? 
if the formula is different, it needs to have a unique name so that the reader can distinguish Mg from Mg plus 2. All right, so if it's an anion, you would change the suffix to ide. Some of you got things marked wrong on the um, elements quiz for F and you wrote fluoride. If you wrote that, I marked you wrong, right? Because fluoride is safe. So if it's fluorine and it lost and it gained an electron, now it's CO minus, that's chloride. Okay, that's how we tell the difference. Sulfur becomes sulfide. Okay, this IDE suffix is attached to an atomic ion, typically a monatomic ion. Now with the cation, you don't change anything about the element's name, you just dump the word ion at the end. So magnesium ion, sodium ion, potassium ion, calcium ion, etc. Okay, so anions get ide as the suffix. Cations, you just put the word ion at the end. All right, now the transition metals, again, the transition metals are this thing that we're skipping right now. So I'm not going to teach you any specific rules to pick what their charge are going to be. However, we can figure out what their charges are based on working backwards. We'll talk about that in a minute. <coughs> but the transition metals, this group right here, they can form multiple charges. Okay? They can form multiple ions. They're a unique group of the periodic table. And so because there are multiple cations in this section of the periodic table, we need to distinguish them. We need to tell them all apart. Okay? So the way we do that is through Roman numerals. The Roman numerals. So for instance, iron is in the transition metals, right? It's element number 26. So there's iron 2, and then there's Both are iron cations. One of them's got a plus 2 charge. One of them's got a plus 3 charge. So the way you denote that difference is Fe2 in parentheses versus Fe3 in parentheses. Okay? That is part of its name. So anytime you see something in the transition metals, ask yourself, is this a, in the transition metals? If it is, you need to include those Roman numerals as part of the charge, as part of the formula, as part of its name. So iron two and iron three are not the same thing. When we start writing names of compounds here in a minute, we'll incorporate that as well. Make sure that you understand when to use Roman numerals. Okay, you don't need to write magnesium two. Right, magnesium group two, it only forms one charge. If we're talking about manganese, Mn, we would need to use Roman numerals, right? Manganese is in the D block, the transition metals. You're gonna need to put Roman numerals. Magnesium is in group, all the have any choice. Does this make sense? So there's two of manganese, just for fun, okay? Manganese would need Roman numerals, magnesium would not. Okay, now there are two other elements you need to denote on your periodic table. Tin and lead. If you find tin and lead on the periodic table, tin is number 50, and then lead's directly underneath it, number 82. Both of those, if you look, they're not technically in the transition metals, but they need Roman numerals too, okay? Because they are anomalous in the sense that they keep on multiple charges. So transition metals plus tin and lead, those do need Roman numerals. So they are outliers in that regard. <coughs> All right, so let's talk about ionic bonding. So we can think about ionic bonding as a very, very strong electrostatic attraction between a cation and an anion. That's technical definition. It's an extremely intense electrostatic attraction. Electrons are lost in one and gained by the other, right? The cation and the anion. One is lost electrons, one is gained electrons. So that creates an ionic bond. Okay? So it's very strong. Again, the, the technical definition uses electrostatic attraction. And it holds them in an ionic compound, an ionic bond. Okay? So for instance, sodium loses that one valence electron and becomes sodium ion. That electron's lost. Whereas chlorine comes along and picks it up. Takes my position in high school. Those of us stopped drawings. Picks up that electron. And now it's got a valence electron. This one's got zero. 
So what we left with, sodium chloride, now have that bond. You know, they, they, like, you know, I don't know, however you want to, however you want to analogize it in human terms, like you're getting married or something. Whatever way it works for you, right? There is one that's lost electron and one that's gained it, and they have that ionic bond. Does this make sense? Have we talked about ionic bonds in prior classes? So here's another picture, right? Losing an electron, gaining an electron, forming the ionic bond. Now this is what it would look like in a crystalline form, right? So sodium chloride one cation went together. And when you're looking at salt crystals, for instance, it's not just one cation and one anion because you can't see that. What you're seeing is the crystal one, the repeating arrangements. Okay, so just make sure you understand sodium chloride the compound is not just one and one, right? For you to be able to see it, it's actually the, the crystal lattice. All right, so let's talk about properties of ionic compounds. This is so important that you understand. They have no charge. An ionic compound has no charge. A single ion has a charge. But once it is with another ion in an ionic bond, that substance, which we now call an ionic compound, has no charge on it anymore. Think about the formula sodium chloride. It's NaCl. There are no pluses, there are no minuses, right? Sodium ion has a charge. Chloride has an ion, but when they get together and they form sodium chloride, the compound, they're not, we get it to go away. Ionic compounds are also known as salts. Okay, so that's why I say salt is a very big term. <coughs> when I say salt, the average Joe thinks about table salt, right, which you put on your food. But technically, any ionic compound is called a salt. Okay, salt is a very, 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 very broad umbrella term to talk about any ionic compound. So if you're out at dinner with your friends tonight and someone says pass the salt, you can be a real jerk and say, which one, right? Because there are technically lots of salts. Ionic compounds have extremely high melt points. You can test out tonight, you can go home and put some um, table salt, which is mostly sodium chloride, but not all. It's also iodized, so there's some iodine in there as well. Um, NAI specifically. But anyway, go home, dump it onto your cookie tray, put it in your oven, and crank hot as it'll go. Leave it in there for three hours, nothing's going to happen. Okay, melting points, melting points are so North of 1300 degrees Celsius. Okay, the oven's not going to anywhere near that. And then most of them dissolve in water. Um, technically, they all do, but the, the extent to which they dissolve varies. Um, we'll get into that which ones dissolve better and which ones don't dissolve. Um, when we talk about ionic uh, solubility rules, and then next semester in Chem 2, we'll really get into that. Why does something dissolve and why does it not dissolve? That all comes back to equilibrium. Uh, but right now, we're just going to say when they dissolve in water, you get the ions back. And then ions are ready to conduct electricity. Okay, so if you take an ionic salt, you dissolve water, you stick your electrode in, the light bulb will go off. Okay? Those ions are capable of conducting a current, which we call an electrolyte. So if you're reading your bottle of sports drink, you know, it says contains electrolytes, and you're like, wow, right? What does that mean? It's not salt. And just a reminder, elements versus compounds, right? The properties of the elements, the individual elements versus the properties of the compound are not the same, right? We're not talking about elements anymore once we talk about a compound. And there's a picture of the dissolving in water. It's actually not an accurate representation of what's wrong with this picture when we get to the solution. And here's something that I want to make sure you understand. When you dissolve an ionic substance in water, what's doing the conducting? It's not the water, okay? H2O is not a conductor. It's a thermal conductor, okay? It doesn't conduct. So you might say, well, you're not going to make it. It's not the water that's doing conducting. It's not the conducting. It's not the ions in the water, right? So your pool, for instance, is a solution. It contains ionic substances. Swimming in a lake, right? Swimming in pure H2O. No way. Or you're in your bathtub and you say, okay, I'm going to take a bath with my toaster tonight just because Dr. Brooks says that I won't get electrocuted. Well, that's not a good idea, right? Because are you sitting in pure H2O in your bathtub? No, you're not. You're not. Okay? So it's not the water that does the conducting, it's the ions that are dissolved in the water. So make sure you understand what the difference is. Okay? Pure water is not a conductor, it's what's dissolved in the water. All right, so let's talk about how we name an ionic compound. We always put the cation first. Then the anion. Start with the positive. Okay? Just like, you know, when I used to teach at middle school and I had parent teacher conferences, you would never start parent teacher conferences. Oh my goodness, your student is just, Bleh. there are all the things that are wrong, right? You never start with that. And if you said that to a parent, that would be not taken very well either. Uh, you always start with positive. You know, these strengths are X, Y, and Z. Here you go, positive. We're going to name our ion compounds the same way. We put the cation first, always, in both naming it and writing the formula. Okay? So if you have C, L, and A, that's not correct, right? Sodium is the cation, um, chloride is the anion. So we drop the ion part. It's not called sodium ion chloride. We drop the ion. It's just called sodium chloride. All right, K3N potassium nitride. 
Now, I can look at this and say with certainty that this is an ionic sub substance because ionic substances are always going to be two metals. Two metals, always. Look at sodium, oh, excuse me, not two metals, a metal and a non-metal, right? Because if you look at the periodic table, sodium is a metal, chlorine is a non-metal, potassium is a metal, nitrogen is a non-metal. Okay, so even if I just give you the formula and ask you, is this ionic or not, just look at it. Metal is not in an ionic compound. Okay? Sodium comes from the metals family, chlorine comes from the non-metals family. And then when they become ions, that would be sodium ion and chloride, which is what gives me the formula, NaCl, and the name sodium chloride. Okay? So you can tell just by looking at it, is it ionic? And then we'll talk about covalent next. Covalent's going to be different. Okay? Ionic is always a one metal, one non-metal. The cation comes from the metals, and the anions come from the non-metals. All right, so just, just shout out your answer. What's the name for AlCl3? Aluminum chloride, good. What's the name for Li3N? Lithium nitride, good. And MdO, magnesium oxide, good. Any questions on how we named these? Right, cation first, anion. I know these are substances because one metal, one on metal, right? That's the family. Magnesium ion comes from the metals family. Oxide comes from the non-metals family. <coughs> All right, now the transition metals, because they form multiple charges, and don't forget to lead, right? To the later, technically not the transition metals, but they form multiple charges too. Those formulas need to include the charge, right? So some of the common names that you may have seen you know, Cooper's versus Kubrick. We're not going to worry about that right now. Ferrous versus ferric. Okay, if you've ever seen that notation before, that's referring to the different charge of iron. But in our class, we're going to use the systematic egg not the code name. Okay? So if your compound means iron 2, you'd write iron 2. If it means iron 3, you'd write iron 3. Some teachers make it memorize which was ferrous and which was ferric. I'm not going to make it I'm just use a systematic name. Okay. So if we're talking about somebody in the transition metals, or tin or lead, we have to include that Roman numeral. We gotta do it, it's part of the name, okay? Oops, I thought I had it written out, but I guess I don't. So if I gave you CuCl2, and I asked what's the name? You have to figure out what copper charge is Working backwards. You're going to have to work backwards, right? Because there's no um, set of rules that I taught you to figure out just by looking at the periodic table what copper's charge is. Right? So I have to break it down. Okay. Chloride has what charge? Charge on chlorine chloride. It's not as minus, right? It's minus one. I don't have to break the one. It's minus. If I've got two chlorines, that copper's charge must be, for this to be neutral. I've got two negatives, what must the charge be here? It's obviously going to be positive it's a metal. Plus two, right. Does that make sense? You gotta work backwards, okay? Looking at the subscripts. If one, if one copper equalizes two chlorides, that must be copper two, okay? What if I gave you this, which also exists? What would that one be? Is that one copper two chloride? No, what's the name on this one? Copper one. Why is it copper one? That's a transition metal, right? So I need to designate that. It's not a, a charge. Right? It's transition metals can be multiple ones. One chlorine and one chloride is enough to cancel out one copper, right? So it's a one to one ratio, so I don't know if that means it's copper one. Okay, so anytime that you've given a element that's in the transition metals, you've got to work backwards from the formula to figure out what the charge must be. Because otherwise, you can't just put copper chloride, that's too ambiguous. We're talking about copper one chloride, or we're talking about copper two chloride, right? You've got to designate the difference there. All right, so let's look at two examples here. FeO versus Fe2O3, right? If I just call this iron oxide, that's way too, right? Because the numerals, both of these would be called iron oxide, yes? So we got a problem here. We gotta figure out what the charge of iron is. Working backwards. Oxide, look at your periodic table. Oxide's charge is negative one, negative two. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, so that means that iron here must be plus two. Do we agree? Is it this one? And there's a one-to-one -one ratio, and that means this one must be positive too, right? Because remember, ionic compounds have no net charge. Do we agree? Now let's look at Fe2O3. Oxide's still negative two, right? Oxide's in group six, it's not changing, so that's still negative two. But now we're looking at the ratio. Three times negative two, so that means that this half is negative six. 
right? If this happens to negative six. Now I've got two irons, so two times what gives me positive six? Three, right? That's three, this one is. So what's the name of this compound? It's not iron oxide, it's what? Iron two oxide, good. And what would the name of this compound be? Iron three oxide, good. Do we see the difference here? Okay, you have to work backwards if there's a transition metal to figure out what the charge is. <coughs> Any questions on nomenclature with? All right, let's go over the answers here. Does CUS need Roman numerals? Yes. Copper's a transition metal. What's the answer? Copper two sulfide. Good. MgO does that need Roman numerals? Nope, it's just magnesium oxide. We actually did that one a minute ago. PBBr2, does that need Roman numerals? Yes or no? Yes, it does. Lead is technically not in the transition metals, according to where it's located on the periodic table, but those two, tin and lead, do need Roman numerals. So what's the name of PBBr2? Lead to bromide, right? And CuCl, does that need Roman numerals? Yes. yes. What's the name there? Good, copper one chloride. Any questions on these four? So it has like the PBPR, PBPR2. Mm -hmm. You would just add that to it to be led to that. Correct. Yeah. So for those of the substitute, you would add. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you have to work backwards, right? Bromide is minus one, and there are two bromides for every one lead. So two negatives over here, so that's a net negative two. So if there's a one here, that means that this must be plus two. So it's that PBBR3, 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 PBBR3. Right, okay. yes, yes. Okay, now let's go the other way. Let's take a name and turn it into a formula. All right, so the salt has no charge. No charge. I will mark you wrong if you write a formula that has pluses and minuses in it. Okay, because look at these. Are there any pluses or minuses in here, anywhere? You see any plus signs or negative signs? No, okay? There has no net charge. So the positives and the negatives have canceled each other out. And then we're gonna use the crisscross method, which is the easiest way to do it without making mistakes. But the most important thing is no charge, okay? If I see pluses and minuses in your answer, I'm going to mark it wrong, and then you're gonna be very sad. Right? Make sure you understand that once you have made the salt, it no longer has a charge anymore. All right, so let's do this one together. Aluminum oxide. So aluminum ion has what charge? It's Al plus three. And oxide has what charge? It's O minus two, okay? So you write your ions just straight off the periodic table. And now, the crisscross method works by this. The superscript of this one becomes the subscript of this one. And the superscript of this one becomes the subscript of this one. <coughs> Excuse me. Does that make sense? Because if you just switch them, you can always double check your work, right? Two times plus three is plus six. Three times negative two is negative six. So this half is positive six, this half is negative six. Okay, if you just crisscross them, you're gonna get it right, assuming that you wrote them correctly here. Right, if this was incorrect, then obviously your answer won't make sense. So just make sure, as long as your cation and anion are correct here, when you crisscross, your formula will be correct as well. And notice this formula. Are there any pluses or minuses in this formula anywhere to be found? No, right? The individual ions, yes, those have charges. Once you've written the formula, there are no net positives or negatives. All right, so if we were doing the crisscross method, now if there's not a one here, right, if it's just plus, right, we're assuming it's plus one, right? Now when we crisscross here, do we need to write a one as a subscript? No, right? This Na2, that's a one, you crisscross it, put a one, you know, two, right? Do you need this one? No, you would just write it as Na2S, okay? Because if there is no subscript, we assume that it's one, okay? That's why the one is not necessary, we just drop it. I won't count points off for it. I would put a slash through it and say not needed, but I won't take off points.
Any questions on how we do the crisscross method? All right, so again, just taking the element ion, turn it into an ion, turn it into an ion, crisscross, turn it into an ion, turn it into an ion, crisscross. So you do these barium oxide, cobalt 3 sulfide, chromium 2 fluoride, and potassium iodide. I'm going to pause the recording for just a second, so bear with me. Barium oxide has what formula? BA what? Now if the ratio is 1 to 1, 2 to 2, it's just BAO, right? Just BAO. Because one barium and one oxide are enough to offset each other. So that would be just BAO. What's the formula for cobalt 3 sulfide? CO2, S3, good. What's the formula for chromium 2 fluoride? CRF2, right? Chromium 2 fluoride. And then potassium iodide would be KI, right? Questions? Questions, questions. Correct. That's a one-to-one -one ratio. Yep. So if it was aluminum nitride, for instance, Al is plus three, nitride is n minus three. That's a one-to-one -one ratio. So just be AlN. Yep. All right. Now let's talk about what we do when our compound contains polyatomic ions. Right. Polyatomic ions are a group of atoms that have a net charge. These all right here are polyatomic ions. Right. In phosphite. PO3 is a group of atoms with a net charge. In thiocyanate, SCN is a group of atoms with a negative charge. In peroxide, it's O2 with a 2 negative. Okay? So when you're writing formulas using polyatomic ions, it's the exact same method as when we're using monatomic ions. The only difference is when it's monatomic, it's one and one, right? One cation, one anion. And it's one single atom in the cation, and one single atom in the anion. When you're dealing with polyatomic ions, the cation might be a group of atoms, the anion might be a group of atoms. Okay, so these are on page 68 of your textbook. These are the ones that your book omits that you need to add. Okay, so like I said, for the quiz, you need to be able to know formula and name. So if I gave you carbonate, you would give me this, CO3 2 minus. If you just wrote CO3, I'm gonna mark the wrong. Right, because that's a group of atoms with a net charge. Or I could give you NO2 minus and you would write nitrite. Right, again, name and formula. So a group of atoms with a net charge, that's a polyatomic ion. We see the difference between monatomic and polyatomic. Monatomic, that's just sulfur that's, that's gained two electrons. Sulfite and sulfate, those are groups of atoms with a net charge. <coughs> All right, so the iod suffix 99% of the time is a monatomic ion with the exception of hydroxide. Hydroxide ends in iod. Right? If you started memorizing your polyatomic ions, maybe you remember them from high school. Right? Hydroxide ends in iod, but it's a polyatomic ion. And so is cyanide. It ends in ide, but it's a polyatomic ion. So with the exception of these two, when the suffix is ide, you know it's monatomic, with the exception of those two in this class. Those are the only two polyatomic ions you are responsible for that end in ide. Right? So so long as it's I mean, monatomic, it's going to end in ide. I mean, all monatomic ions are going to end in ide anyway. Ite and eight suffixes always refer to polyatomic ions. Sulfite is going to be a polyatomic ion. Sulfate is going to be a polyatomic ion. Again, hydroxide, 
and cyanide in an eye as well, but they're not monatomic, they're polyatomic. And just by looking at them, could you tell which one has polyatomic ions versus which one is monatomic? No, you're not gonna be able to distinguish that just by observing, okay? Never gonna be able to distinguish that. So if you have hard water, right, calcium carbonate's primarily responsible for that. When we name polyatomic ions, the process is no difference. Cation first, anion second, right? So if you had KMNO4, this is why you gotta memorize both name and formula so that you can identify MNO4 as the permanganate ion, right? Potassium permanganate. Make sense? So polyatomic ion nomenclature works exactly the same as it did with monatomic ion nomenclature. The only difference here is, instead of it being one atom and one atom, you're gonna have one atom usually, or maybe two atoms and two atoms, right? They're gonna be groups. It's not just gonna be two atoms total, you're gonna have three or four represented. Right, so if it's only two elements, that must be from two monatomic ions. And if it's more than two elements, you've got at least one polyatomic, right? NH4OH, H2SO4, et cetera, which actually isn't ionic, that's covalent, but it's beside the point. Right, so polyatomic versus monatomic, right? This is a monatomic, one barium, two, excuse me, barium cation, two chlorides. That's monatomic, monatomic. Whereas this is barium cation and two phosphates. Do you see the difference here? And so I could ask you something like this, right? There's a similar picture to that in your book. But we're still gonna use the crisscross method, okay? And we are gonna use parentheses anytime we have more than one polyatomic ion. It's really important that you know this. If you've got more than one polyatomic ion, you gotta put parentheses around it. So for instance, calcium phosphate, let's write the formula for this. Calcium has what charge? It's a monatomic ion. It's plus two. Does anyone know phosphate? You got that far yet? PO, it's got a minus three charge. PO4, three minus, right? Okay, so when you crisscross those, this two, if you wrote PO4, two, that would be read as P and then O, 42. That doesn't make sense, right? There is no way you're gonna have 42 oxygens on one phosphorus, that's just nonsense, right? So you put parentheses around that polyatomic ion to tell the reader you've got two phosphates. Because if you omit that, otherwise it's gonna be read as P, O, 42, which doesn't make sense. A lot of students will remember the parentheses on ones like this. It's hydroxide where they forget, tend to forget it. Okay, this is why we use parentheses because we've got groups of atoms here. So, just name, shout it out. What would the name of A be? Actually, I'll give you a second to think about A. Um, I'll give you a second to think about B too. And just a hint, okay, if you're dealing with polyatomic ions versus monatomic ions, you still need to ask yourself if your cation is in the transition metals or not. That's just a hint. So, do we need Roman numerals for A? Yes, we do. What is the charge on iron? Three, right. You can think about just uncrisscross, right? 
you uncrisscross the knees. This three becomes the superscript here. This two becomes the superscript here, right? So this is iron three, and then what's SO4 two minus? That's sulfate. So it's iron three sulfate. <coughs> Do we need Roman numerals for this one? Aluminum's not in the transition metal, so no. What's the name of this? Aluminum hydroxide. Now here's something I see students do a lot. With hydroxide, it's particular to hydroxide and cyanide. Those two, for some reason, students tend to forget the parentheses. They'll leave off the parentheses and they'll write ALOH3. No parentheses. Okay, what is that telling the reader? That's telling the reader it's one aluminum, one oxygen, and three hydrogens. If there are no parentheses there, right? But that's not correct. It's saying there are three hydroxide ions. That's what those parentheses tell me. And so for hydroxide and cyanide, for whatever reason, those two team seem to be ones that students forget parentheses on. Probably because if you forget parentheses on sulfate, you're going to have a subscript of 43. And that rings a bell in your head going, that's not right. right? If you forget parentheses here and you end up with a subscript of three, there's not a red flag that goes off, right? So remember, hydroxide and cyanide, those are the two that tend to forget about it. Remember to use parentheses. All right, that's where we're going to stop for today. We'll do covalent bonding on uh, Friday after our quiz. So that's where we'll stop.